What's up, brother? Welcome to the show. Super excited to have you here, man. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I know that we've been trying to do this for a minute, um, and I know you've had some, some awesome guests on your podcast, so I'm honored to be a part of it. I'm honored to share uh, some time with you as well. Yeah, bro. It's, uh, it's been a long time coming and um, I'm really excited because uh, I think it was Julian that connected us in the first place. Julian Guterlai, awesome yep. guy. Yep. Spoke very highly of you. And then uh, just for everybody, we, we had a chat about some, some other stuff. And then we were like, I, I wanted to get you on your show because what you're doing you know, with Superhero Academy and passion, what is it? It's Passion to Profit course and all this <laughs> stuff happening. So um, Really excited to unpack that as well as what you've been up to. We were just talking beforehand about you traveling, you mm -hmm. know, Madagascar, all these kind of things. So, um, yeah, lots to talk about, man. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's dive in. Cool, bro. So I always like to kind of start back in the beginning just to give people an idea about you if they're just learning about you and, um, you know, just kind of being like, whoa, who is this guy? But I want to know more about him. What was it like for you growing up, man? What, talk us, walk us through a little bit of your journey growing up and maybe some challenges that you may have faced um, on the path of getting where you are today. Sure, yeah. I, I, I think growing up, I, I really had the most privileged life of all time. I'm, I'm the son of uh, immigrants, uh, Italian immigrants that moved to Canada, um, basically only speaking Italian and only knowing uh, and having a few dollars in their pocket. My father ended up living with like 13 people in a... In a uh, I guess a two bedroom apartment, um, you know, when he first moved over. I mean, he was a, he was a child, of course, uh, but my grandparents really paved the way. And so did my parents and learning English and going to school and then, you know, raising me on the, on the suburbs of Montreal. Uh, I currently still live and grew up and, and born and raised in Montreal and proud of it. Um, and I, I had a, a privileged life. I mean, I think I, I had all the video games I ever wanted. I had all the Christmas gifts, uh, you know, all the things that, that, you know, uh, made me go to, uh, through public school system, uh, you know, throughout in both French and English, learned a little bit about the world. And it, and it kind of ended up with me feeling in the end, at some point when I turned 18, a little bit disenfranchised um, with kind of the options that I had for expanding my own consciousness. And at the time for me, that looked like smoking weed and uh, hanging out with my friends, but not being able to tell my parents, not being able to tell anyone because it was shunned and illegal and all the things, right? right. And, um, you know, obviously the world has changed since then. Uh, that was 13 years ago. I'm now a 31 year old. Um, but I've been in an entrepreneurial journey since then. So since 18 years old, I, I, I ended up buying an indoor skate park. Um, and my goal was to build a community. I've always wanted to build the community I wish I could have grew up in and the school I wish I could have gone to. Because the truth is that as I went to university at the exact same time as I ran the indoor skate park, I realized the disconnect between what you learn in books and what you learn in real life. And there's just something to be said about what that really looks like. I, I really believe that we um, are starving for real connection. We are starving for real um, practice uh, and experience in our education system. And I felt that the world needed more of that. We, we needed to expand that consciousness in a big way. And so I started on a journey. I, I, I ended up selling the skate park out of, out of you know, just completely a 180 degree turnaround that, that basically came into my life uh, for various reasons. Um, but all that to say, I ended up walking out into the middle of a GMO corn and soil field after committing to watch a documentary a week every single week for 52 weeks straight. Uh, I learned a ton about the world, of, a ton about all the problems in the world as documentaries are, uh, are really good at alarming the problem and spending 95% 90, of the time saying, we've got an issue, and very little time letting us know what we can really do about it. Um, but I champion them as still opening my eyes. And, and so out of a fit of rage, depression, scarcity, being afraid, having no idea what I could do and feeling very small, um, I walked out in the middle of a GMO corn and soil field that uh, wasn't mine, but I knew it was for sale and, and planted a tree and literally said I would build the physical school, build it as a farm, build it as an eco village, as a community. Um, and that eventually turned into building the online school, which is now known as Superhero Academy. So it's been a journey. I mean, um, you know, uh, growing up, I, I feel uh, very privileged to have gone to the public education system. And, I, you know, it's not to say that I learned nothing in all of these things. I learned something. I learned how to speak English um, in many ways. Yeah. And at the same time, I 
feel like there's so much more that could be had for all of us through mentorship. Um, and so that's kind of the, the premise of, of the way I like to teach and the way I like to empower people um, and, and real world examples. You know, all the, all the work that we were doing in school was always theoretical and it was always some overpriced textbook that they came out with a new edition of each and every single year to make money and pillage our parents' pockets and our, you know, our futures uh, through student debt. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that's uh, going to be a problem. That whole system is going to collapse in America. It's a, it's a massive issue. People are running out of money to student debts. If they start raising interest rates, the world is going to collapse quite literally. Um, and that's why we're not seeing it happen. But that's going to lead to more inflation. That's going to lead to more problems. Um, and all of that motivates me to do something different. So I know I gave a little monologue over there, but it gives you an idea. That's perfect, man. No, and... Um... It's so true because a lot of times, even when you go to school, you get out of school, there's no guarantee you're going to get a job either. Of course So not. you're already, you're already in debt. Mm -hmm. and then you're going into it. You, you don't even know and half the, half the stuff by the time you get to it, it's, there's no demand for it anymore. So oh, absolutely. A lot of, like I have so many friends and this is the thing. So I'm 36, you're 31, same mm -hmm. sort of area. Mm -hmm. So many friends growing up that went to school to do something to be the, 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 the hot shot investment banker or whatever they are. And mm -hmm. they're not, they're not even doing that anymore. They had to like go do something else totally. because they weren't ready. They, they, they didn't have the tools to understand um, the life experience to know that that wasn't actually something they wanted to do. Totally. I mean, how many people become lawyers and never spent a day with a lawyer? How many people yeah. train to be doctors and have never spent a day in a hospital? I mean, yeah. it's through eventually in their education, they have to do residencies and all these things. But yeah. by the time they made that decision, it's too late. They've already indebted themselves. They're already committed to the path. By the time they've gotten a taste of what the real world actually is, they don't know what they've signed up for. And to make the decision in, in, you know, in Quebec at, what, 16 years old coming out of high school? I mean, you, know, you go to grade 11 and basically and then you have to pick your life. That's not to say that you can't change the path later. And if, I believe yeah. that anybody could change your path at any point. It's a decision away. And, and that's why I talk about turning your passion into profits. This is one of the things that I teach um, beyond, let's say, general entrepreneurship, marketing, storytelling, you whatever you want to call it. Um, all that to say is that we, it's a difficult position to put us in. And it was championed as a safe route. Uh, but I believe that that's a lie. It's an illusion. And it's, it's, it is what worked for some people and it will continue to work for some people. And if your job requires a piece of paper, by all means, I'm not, I'm not you know, hating on anyone's decision. Uh, I'm just willing to build an alternative. I'm the type of person who says, I'm going to point a finger, but if I'm going to point a finger, I'm going to realize that there's three pointing back at me. Right. And right. so the truth is, I want it to be a part of my version of the solution, what I wanted to go to. And, and that's what I believe I'm championing. And that's why it's worked somehow, right? That's, that's why it's gotten to the point it's, it is at the moment. Um, and I'm still able to make it grow slowly but surely and, and chip away at it, not without its challenges. Yeah, that's, it's so true, man. So what do you, what do you love about the entrepreneur game? You know, and what do you feel that is, is valuable? Like obviously storytelling, maybe let's get into that. Like how sure. important is storytelling for being an entrepreneur? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's storytelling is important for everything in life. Yeah. I mean, whether what you believe as a religion, what you believe you should eat, you know, what everything you believe in, in a sense is a story that you were somehow told or bought or, or researched yourself right on YouTube university or on Google as well. Yeah. And the truth is that everything all the beliefs that you hold and have are somehow wrapped into a story because you didn't do all the studies as whether or not something is good for you or bad for you. You don't know all the information is true that you've ever heard. You just have to take some things at face value. And yes, of course, you've dove in deep into your one field or your specialty. And, you know, and my specialty, uh, one of the things that I've dived deep into is human attention, right? What do we spend our attention and time doing? And that, is, for whatever reason, it fascinates me. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I wanted to see what the narrative was and how to change a narrative, right? Watching all those documentaries, which I ended up doing for eight and a half years and expanded to audio books and Ted talks and, and other things over time, of course, because there's only so many documentaries you can watch. Um, what ended up happening for me is that I realized that there was a narrative problem in the first place, that essentially we were, we were creating a scenario where we were championing the problem way more than we were ever championing the solutions. And, and science is, you know, some studies have been done that showed that there was at some point, I can't remember who did the study. It was 80 articles for every one article that talked about the, the problems of climate change to the solutions to climate change. 
80 about the problem, one about the solution. That's the ratio we were fighting against. Right. And so that's telling. You know what I mean? I think that's telling. And, and I believe that if we're going to change the world, we number one have to start with ourselves. We have to start with our own story. And then we have to just communicate our journey. And, and it's not to say that what I know or what I don't know is better or worse than anybody else. It's not to say that my decisions are better or worse than anybody else's. It's only to say that this is the path that I chose for me. Mm. And, and that's the story I want to live. That's the story I want to uh, continuously uphold. And, and it's those stories, how that is communicated online via podcast. I mean, if you're listening to this, you're listening to my story, you're listening to a story somehow. Um, it's a form of propaganda good or bad, it, it sways our decisions, it sways and, and ch changes our lives. Um, and in many ways, it changes the course of history. Yeah, it's so true. Everything's a story. Everything. And it goes literally back- literally everything. It goes back to being a kid and being told stories. It's, it's like what we connect totally. to, you know? Or mm -hmm. back in the tribal days where somebody was telling the tribe a story. And uh, it's, it's fascinating to me, man, because even in the marketing world, you know, I've done, you know, in the past Facebook ads and, and just all this kind of stuff. I've just learned that it's all about the story, you know, 100%. and, and cause people don't care about, you know, if you just, if you're telling them this or buy this or do that, they don't care. They want a connection. It's that mm -hmm. connection to, Oh, he's just like me or she's just like me a little bit. Right. What, what makes a good story though? Because there's obviously a good way and there's uh, one that's not so good. Like what, what would be for somebody that wants to learn how to tell their story properly or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever way that is, what's, what, what makes a good one and what makes a bad one? Um, I think a bad one is a story that is meant to only convince somebody of something rather than tell somebody something and allow them to make their own conclusions. So right. if you're trying to sell all the time and you're tr constantly trying to essentially really spread propaganda and, and just kind of convince me of something endlessly, that is generally what I would consider to be a bad story. It could work. It doesn't mean it's not going to work. I mean, Facebook ads that purely sell do make millions of dollars and, and sell product all the time. But it's not necessarily a story that we share. It's not a story that we would write home about. It's not the story that we put on Netflix. It's not the story that we put on, you know, a Disney movie or whatever it is. I mean, you know, I'm wearing this shirt that my friend Germ made, which is oh, that's a awesome. censored world. Um, and it's, you know, about how in many ways, the stories that we've learned as kids, uh, whether it be superhero movies or Disney movies or whatever it is, well, they were there to teach us something. And I think that there was a, a lot of value in those stories. And, you know, yeah. if you watch a Lion King, there's some value in what you learn from something like that. If you watch Batman, there's some value in what you learn from those things. Yeah. And I believe that those stories, however, are not all that unique. Meaning the story that you've heard of Batman, the story you've heard of a Disney movie, they, they all have predictable endings and you still watch them anyway. Yeah. So what made the value of that story powerful well i think it's really what it, how it relates to you right can you see the truth of what the the moral of the story is or the storyline of the story is um and and the fight between let's say the villain and the superhero in a in a, in a movie and the you know the the challenge that a, that the superhero faces when trying to tackle you know the life's life's problems now of course it's dramatized in the in the most crazy of ways and you know in a batman movie it's uh, jumping without the rope and there's a, some nuclear bomb that's going to go off and blah 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 right mm -hmm. but but realistically we relate to that we relate to batman we relate to gotham we relate to um the the, the plight that people have we relate to the no uh, the noble cause that batman stands for uh, which if, you know, you ever ask you what, you know, Batman stands for, most of you would say probably justice, right? Something like that is one of the yeah. first words that will come out. Yeah. So the truth is that we, the fact that we all come out with that story um, and we all come out with some of the lessons and those lessons become obvious to us to some degree and we apply them differently, but nonetheless, that is an effective story and it, and it, evokes us to think about ourselves, our life, um, and, and create some context. Those who do that deeper and really integrate those lessons, um, you know, power to you. And those who just want to go and leave a, I don't know, a Rotten Tomatoes review, you know, great, great on you too. You know what I mean? Like it, it, we all integrate and, and hear stories and receive stories um, and let them impact us in different ways. And, and those stories don't have to be so blatant. They don't have to be movies or or, or, you know, Facebook videos. Um, sometimes they're just a story of what your friend told you, you know, something that happened on a trip that they went on or, um, you know, a tragedy that they faced. You know, these stories 
allow us to think um, and to put perspective and to shift perspective in our life. And, and I think that shifting of perspective is refreshing and beautiful um, and supportive. Yeah. And there's always that person that's just captivating that knows how to how to, how to tell the group a good story. You know, there's some people that just aren't, they just suck at it. And then there's, there's always that person that like your uncle, you have that uncle that can tell stories. And <laughs> everybody's just like, everyone's into it. And I always find yeah. that fascinating because there's well, a certain amount of skill to that. It's a, it's an absolute art. It, it is a absolute skill. To take you skill. on this ride, this journey of like, you, you don't want them to stop. And then there's certain, t certain stories people are telling you like, all right, just stop. Like, this is terrible. Absolutely. And I mean, look, if you think of sports as a story, if you think of comedians and, and, and comedy specials as stories, yeah. I mean, they're all stories. I mean, yeah. these are all cra carefully crafted narratives that are essentially moved through with, with some variable yeah. um, elements, right? In a comedy show, it's somebody might yell something out of the crowd and, and you might go in a particular direction or not, depending on what city you're in. Um, but in sports, we don't know what's going to happen, but we know there's going to be some resolution to the end of the story, meaning one team's going to win and one team's going to lose you know, other than the occasional draw, I guess, but the, yeah. but you get what you, that's the idea, right? Yeah. And so that narrative is there and we get to, we witness the drama of it. And whether you're doing that for some telenovela, you know, uh, uh, you know, daytime soap opera, or whether you're doing that um, in a movie theater or in a classroom um, or in your day-to-day -day life, I think those stories matter. And, and we are consumed by stories on all yeah. fronts. I mean, Radio, podcasts, you name it. In every format, uh, visual, auditory, ads, you know, words, yeah. things that we see, colors tell stories, yeah. honestly. You know what I mean? They evoke certain things that, that we just don't even realize. Even the font behind you that says, trust the universe. Yeah. You know, in a different font, it, it, it evokes something different than, you know, the all caps, what I would guess is Bebas New uh, font right there, right? Yeah. But, the, <laughs> but that's just the truth of it. Like, yeah, they, these things sure. impact. For sure. What are, what are some, is there any specific documentaries that you're talking about that were like game changers for you? Like just like oh. eye, op eye opener, like ones that maybe a lot of people don't know about. Sure. I was always open for documentaries. Like I've watched lots over the years. Now I'm, I'm a little bit more skeptical because I know a lot of them are, there's bigger, there's, there's, there's bigger interests at play who are funding yeah. And they get there's, made for a reason. Yeah, and there's not just like you know some some uh, some guy out of out of college just making it in his garage for a uh, you know for fun. It, like there's yeah. a lot of mo hidden motives in some of these. So totally. I, I I like those ones that are that are just expressing somebody's opinion, and there's not a, like a lot of dollars behind it. Is there any specific ones that yeah. really hit home for you? Um, I, look, I, I believe that the, you know, Peter Joseph who ended up making the Zeitgeist series oh, was yeah. totally a guy who was at home just yes. sharing his truth. I, I don't believe that it's funded by some uh, oh. big conglomerate or anything of that nature. Uh, Zeitgeist, when I learned about where money came from, Zeitgeist addendum specifically. So the second one that was amazing, um, man, Zeitgeist was probably the most impactful documentary I've ever watched for me. I agree. Because it's set in motion so much more, right? Yeah. Um, you know, it, when things like loose change came out and I started questioning whether 9-11 happened the way it did or didn't yeah. and whether it, I mean look I believe that the planes hit the building and, and towers went down <laughs> but yeah. that's obvious but who did it why they did it what are the motives did somebody know did somebody not know did who was involved blah 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 blah, blah. either way that the official story is definitely not the whole truth it's oh. part partially true it's partially got some truth in it and maybe it partially doesn't and i'm not trying to say it's one way or the other in fact i don't know yeah. i i what it what i liked about the documentaries you know cowspiracy has changed me in many ways and made me think about things M mission blue chasing ice or chasing coral phenomenal documentaries i can i can name a whole bunch and i intend to make a a, a best of list and i and i have before in the past but i, I intend to now share more about the, the, the content I consume because I, I do learn a ton yeah. from YouTube and Netflix and all these things all the time. That yeah. long story short is they are all impacted me in some way, shape or form. But I think the biggest way they impacted me is to make me become a critical thinker, which is not teaching me necessarily how to think or what to think, which many documentaries were successful in making me think, you know, in their direction. Um, but they made me start to question the narrative right? To question motivations, to realize there are, there are hidden forces behind every 
content or every piece of creation that there's an algorithm that says that you may or may not see something. There's, there's ways we get things in front of people or there's ways that things are engineered to, uh, to move the needle and, and elections are won on these things, right? I mean, there's, there's all kinds of stories and narratives that literally change the fabric of our world and the results of our world each and every single day. So it made me, it made me start to think about our limited perspectives and our, our constant need for info seeking um, and what that looks like, what that feels like and how that impacts um, the decisions that we make and therefore the, the lifestyles that we have and therefore the impact that we end up having on the world around us. Mm -hmm. And so those stories matter. Um, you know, and, and, and they matter because they make movements like Black Lives Matter, uh, but they also make movements like Occupy Wall Street, which was massive for me. Not because of what it achieved in the end, but who it made me meet and what, again, it made me, inspired me to do. I, I, I don't know that I walk out in the middle of that GMO corn and soil field had I not gone there and then interviewed David Suzuki, who I just randomly saw and I was there with a camera. It was my first ever day as a journalist. Yeah, pure, pure, and it was a journalist on my own. Like I wasn't doing it for any specific um, uh, media company or anything. I, I had started my own media company called WSB Media, which stands for Why Simply Because. So it, all of this spawns out of the ideas that I just wanted to be an informed citizen. And, and you know, I think for a long time, I thought that that was the, the higher path that was a, made me better than other people. And now that I, you know, I've, I've aged and grown wiser, I just realized it makes me different than other people. Um, and different people are different than me in their own ways too, right? Some people care about what sneakers they're wearing and other people care about, um, you know, the, the, the latest flavor that is going to come out of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Mm -hmm. You get to care about whatever you want. You know, these are, these are all things that, are, that have their niches and have their, their opportunities and, and there's so much uh, human potential. But there's those who know how to control the narrative um, and know how to use that narrative that, that tend to benefit and change the world. Elon Musk is an example of that, um, you know, somebody who's per personally inspiring to me. But I've also seen Richard Branson do it, all, as well as I've seen like Obama and Donald Trump do it. I mean, these people are narrative hijackers and they are phenomenal at it. They know what they're doing. Uh, you know, as you can see any politician as an idiot, um, but they have some skill and that skill is important, um, you know, and it is definitely moving the needle in some ways. Uh, and at the same time, they're puppets and, and you know, they're just public figures who are spokespeople for, you know, larger, larger things that are happening. And yeah. no one person is in control of any single thing. Uh, we're all part of this human experience. And um, yeah, we have influence. And that influence is, is now like very real. It's something yeah. we experience online with Instagram and whatever it is, but uh, it's changing. And the, the way the narrative, it's democratized a lot. You know, it used to be that we have to only listen to a couple of radio stations and a couple of um, TV channels. Now, yes, many of those TV channels, even though there's thousands of them, are owned by a couple of companies. But we still have this. Nobody's controlling what I say. Nobody's controlling what you say right now. Mm. And, you know, we, we get to continue to share that and we'll always innovate and find ways for the truth and for our, our opinions and our ideas and our stories uh, to spread. Yeah, no, well said, man. Um, do you ever... Do you ever feel that there's too much information? Do you ever get overwhelmed with too oh, many man. too many opinions? Because you know you hear one thing and then you got ten different variations of that, and it can be super confusing. And I was actually I was talking to somebody about this the other day, and you know when you have mentors, right? You have different people, different authors. <laughs> yeah. You could just get you can go down those rabbit holes of all these opinions. And then you're basically fucked because you don't know which one is because a lot of them contradict each other. What are your thoughts on all that stuff? Because it's, it can be super overwhelming, over consuming as well, right? Absolutely. I mean, look, I'm, I'll be the first to admit I'm addicted to the internet. I'm addicted to yeah. content consumption in many ways. I'm, yeah. And if the fact that you're listening to this means that you probably are too, right? Yeah. So realistically, <laughs> if you're listening to this, we, you recognize you are a content consumer, whether you want it or not, mm -hmm. you are. Now, uh, because you'll see it, even if you chose to get off all social media, you're going to see it online on the newspaper stands. You're going to walk by ads on the street, like there's buses and billboards and all kinds of stuff. Okay. So you are a content consumer. The question becomes, how do you balance that? What are you contributing to the content? How much time are you spending consuming content versus creating content? Right. So that's what I focus on. How I get over the overwhelm of what is going on in the world is I focus on my ability, not only to contribute to it, but what is the unique perspective? What can I bring to the table that maybe adds value in a unique way? Um, and part of that was focused on like, how do I get the most amount of eyeballs? And I, I've learned a thing or two about that. Um, 
I think now it's more important to, for me to just, what is my genuine opinion on something and how do I get to explore that? Um, and the more I do that, the more that I recognize that the eyeballs and all the things that come with that come. And, and I don't care how many people are watching something. I'm creating it for the sake of being a creator uh, and sharing my own expression. And, you know, if it reaches a bunch of people, so be it. If it doesn't, so be it there too. But I believe that if you provide value and you speak truth, you will remove the sense of overwhelm, which I feel all the time um, as an entrepreneur. It's literally part of the game, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and turn it into kind of a creative fuel for your own fire. And, uh, and sometimes that's, that's, that's the way to do it. That's, that's important. You got great content, man. Like, oh, thank you. It's, uh, yeah, I try. I'm going to make sure everybody, when, when this wraps up, where to find you, because you, you got great stuff and people can learn a lot from you, man. And um, thank you. You know, what the next thing that I really wanted to tie into this was your, how you developed this awareness and how plant medicine kind of <laughs> came to be. Because you're obviously a bright guy. You had this this awareness young, you realize this, the school system and all that documentaries, you're probably ahead of most at that mm-hmm. age, right? Mm-hmm. So you probably felt alone in a lot of areas and, and all this kind of stuff. And that's usually totally. what happens. Totally. How did, how did plant medicine come into your life and, and walk us through a little bit of the journey, however that looks? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying plant medicine came into my life because I had spare time. Okay. And that's what privilege is, right? Privilege is that I have the time to choose what I'm going to do rather than having to forcefully fight for my existence. Now, here's the truth. If you grew up in Canada, you grew up in America, in Europe, essentially, if you're watching this, the likelihood is you are equally privileged in some ways <laughs> because you have a phone and you have access to the internet and the world of all the content. And I just chose to spend my time learning about those things and, and doing those things in a way that for me, I valued very heavily. That came at the sacrifice of me spending a ton of time in bars, having hanging out or at sporting events or doing other things that maybe other people might value. And that I would say that the general culture, at least of Montreal on a you know, typical Friday night is not doing what I was doing, which was watching documentaries or learning about you know, social media or you know, in meetings or filming and creating podcasts and building a whole damn studio uh, that I called the Story Tory, for example, right? So awesome. I spent a lot of, lot of time learning. Um, and, and I think that the truth for me of how that, let's say, evolved and how that made me feel is it made me feel more and more disillusioned with the, with the, with the mainstream narrative. So I, told, I mentioned before that, you know, essentially, uh, the only gateway drug that weed was, was a gateway drug into psychedelics. Um, and, and, and yeah, we, of course you explore with that because you were told that it was bad. You were told that it was illegal. You were told that it was going to fry your brain. But in truth, it made me connect some synapses I don't think I would have connected otherwise. It made me start to think differently. Again, rationally, it made me start to question everything as, you know, Joe Rogan has a, a show called at one point on, on TV or wherever yeah, it was, right? That's right. But yeah. the point is that I believe that it, it leads you down a rabbit hole that you cannot come back out of. You can choose to ignore. You can choose to become complicit nonetheless, but I just didn't choose that. And I still don't choose that. I, I, I can't unlearn what I've learned. And, I'm, and, and if I don't do anything at all with what I know, then I'm a hypocrite and I cannot point the finger. I cannot blame the system. And even though as much as that sounds great, right? I, I used to blast Lincoln Park and want to, to end the system and, and rage against the machine and all the things that go with that. But but the truth is that, and those are healthy forces. In fact, yeah. they motivated me to start Valhalla, which is the farm in the, the 66 acre eco village that I'm starting in Montreal, uh, you know, a few years ago and where I planted the tree and all that whole thing. Right. Mm-hmm. So all of that, it motivated me in that direction. But over time I had to transmute that from the fire that is in my kind of my sacral, right. My, 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 my bottom chakra, the, the, the energy of anger and passion and all these things as I would, you know, you would see it as red, if yeah. you will that energy started to move through me and transform into, okay, what can I do, right? What can I be empowered to do uh, to make this happen? And, and so psychedelics played a massive role. Uh, mushrooms specifically, uh, I was introduced to other uh, plant medicines. I ended up going to Peru recently and doing yeah. ayahuasca. Um, so each and every time I do psychedelics, I feel that it enables me to recognize and be more and more self-aware and also more and more compassionate about the world and also more and more humble 
that I know nothing about it, right? Why don't you take a psychedelic and you see that everything starts to vibrate and move a little bit and, and things, you know, colors start to swirl when you look at a light. And, you know, that's the, that's the easy way of depicting it on visually on a movie or something. But I think it has a profound inward journey that it creates that allows you to reconnect to the world, to, to the universe, both inside of you and outside of you. And it makes you ask questions. And again, it, it reframes the perspective that I have. And by reframing your perspective on a regular basis, you are going to come to very different conclusions than the ones that are painted in the narrative of, you should be a Republican or a Democrat. You should be left or you should be right. You should be this or that. You are either for something or against something. And the truth is that the world is more nuanced than that, right? There, there is a lot more gray zone than we make it sound, but the extremes, get all the attention. And the more and more that we are fighting for that attention, the more we democratize attention, as does social media, the more we all have to fight to kind of build the narratives that, that kind of uh, end up getting the headlines and end up being spoken about. So it's no, it should come as no shock that those who are good at getting headlines, whether good or bad, are going to create division. And division, for the most part in the world, creates 5149. It's amazing that 50-50 pretty much, or 51-49, we are men and women in the world. It's amazing that all American elections and 51-49, almost everything in our world is just one or two degrees away from being the opposite. And that's so incredible. It's so yeah. wild. And so, so the, the devil is in the details, but so is the beauty. And, and the more that you can stop and smell the roses and see the details, the more you can have empathy for life and compassion for life. But also the more you look into the details, you can also see apathy for life and, 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 and you know, challenges behind it. So, you know, is a documentary that's funded by, uh, you know, Caspiracy, for example, was funded by uh, James Cameron, who is a vegan and or, you know, wants to promote veganism, vegetarianism in some way, shape or form. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I, I mean, I don't know. I think he believes in it. I think he has a, he had very good intentions of making movies like Avatar. Um, is he a saint? No. Nobody is, right? You're only a saint when you're dead and nobody knows you and they, nobody can slander you from there. But yeah, that's just the, the, the truth of the, of the narrative. But, but it is eye-opening. And, and without a doubt, Cowspiracy was eye-opening for many people, including me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it all depends. There's so many ways to look at those documentaries too, right? There's so many perspectives, right? There's so many... There's a lot of stuff that they don't talk about and it's just easy for us to kind of look one way. But yeah, I mean, when it comes to all that, like especially game changers and, and all this new stuff coming out, I just think, I've talked about this before. I think a lot of people need to base their decisions on more than documentaries, you know? I think they need to do their research and look at the other areas because there are other, other people telling different things too, right? And yep. I think people can a lot of, well, lately, a, a lot of people are making choices on one documentary. And whether, whether that's right or wrong, there's always, you know, two, three sides to every story. So, totally. I mean, how, how do you decipher, like, you know, how do you decide which one, what you gravitate towards? You know, like, what, what is it? Is it, is it your moral <laughs> beliefs? Is it what your family did? Like, why do people get so attached to some of these ideas, but then they won't explore the other side of it? You know, how do you... It's because of the narrative and the identity that they build within that. Yeah. Because once they've made a decision that there are a particular, you know, camp, like, you know, everyone knows that, you know, how do you know that there's a vegan? Well, they told you, right? Everyone yeah. makes that joke because it's yeah. true. It's yeah. an identity thing. It's, it's, yeah. it's not a general, it's a generalization, of course, and, and, and power to the people who choose to be vegan or paleo, yeah. this or that, I don't care. Uh, it's good on you, you know what I mean? And, and power to you. But it's because it becomes such a strong identity that we attach ourselves to it. And the more you attach yourself to anything in life, the more you are going to end up being biased by that thing in yeah. some way, shape, or form. Yeah. So if you attach yourself to a Republican or Democrat, then the likelihood that you're going to change your mind is going to, you're always going to see the world through those lenses. Yeah. And, and, and you're going to paint the picture in a particular way. And I did that too. When I learned about, you know, the, the potential miscommunication or the, not miscommunication, but the misinformation, sorry, is the one I'm, yeah. word I'm looking for. Around 9-11, it made me start to think of everything that everyone said was bullshit and that yeah. there was a conspiracy and everything. And Look, I think there's more conspiracies than we, we care to admit. I, I think there's a, there's a yeah. ton of conspiracies. The world runs on conspiracy, okay? Yeah. I mean, money is made out of, out of nothing. There's more yeah. debt than there is money. That is a conspiracy at the highest of order if I've ever seen one. Yet, 
you still go to whatever store, whether it be Whole Foods or Walmart, and you buy things with money. So whether yeah. you're doing the good thing or the bad thing, you're, you're essentially operating in the same system that is yeah. long here before you. So I, I, what I choose to do is, is rather than make a, a decision, rather than snap my decision, I, I choose to slow down. Yeah. Number one, right? Rather than saying, I believe something or I, I think something, I, I speak from myself, from, from my own personal beliefs. And, and rather than preach, uh, which I've done a ton of, by the way, um, I look to only be better than the person I was yesterday. Yeah. And I've learned that over time, I, I get to make those decisions through a volume of content, seeing different perspectives, learning from different sides. And you can see what those things end up shifting and changing. You know, do I think that that, I don't know what, in Netflix world, uh, the documentary Game Changers came out and a ton of people were like, I don't know how you're ever going to eat meat again. Yeah. And then it's like, yeah. And if you were to go and watch a documentary, you know, that, that speaks to the other side of things, yeah. uh, you might think otherwise. I, I, yeah. I really believe that we have a recency bias. Yeah. And that is part of the human condition, that what we heard more recently tends to weigh more heavily in our mind. And the more you are aware of these things, the more you can curb your mind to say, wait a second, I shouldn't be a short-term thinker. I shouldn't just think about what has happening right now, but I can zoom out and go to a larger view and a perspective. And that is the thing that has changed my entire career. If there's one thing that I am particularly good at more than most that I, that I encounter is that I'm a long-term thinker. And I believe that many entrepreneurs are, not all entrepreneurs are, but many entrepreneurs are, and those who are win big time in every category. It's not just entrepreneurship. If you think long-term when it comes to going to school and, and becoming a doctor, you put in the work, you know, when you were young, you just got all the debt. But if you do go out and get a doctor's job and you become a heart surgeon, you're going to pay it off. Like it's going to work, right? And if you're dedicated and you're willing to see a longer term play, again, you're, you're going to see so much more. The problem is we live in a world where this is our attention span. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and we're becoming goldfish in many ways and, and it's just engineered that way. And, and unfortunately, our minds aren't strong enough that, to always deal with that. No yeah. matter how powerful and, and good you are, you can get you know, uh, sucked into a Twitter debate in the comments uh, just like anybody else. I mean, there, there's, there's lots out there that's meant to pillage your attention um, and take advantage of it. And the more you become aware, the more you become self-aware, whether it be meditation or yoga or, or whatever that is that makes you start to stop and think. For me, it's pacing. Uh, you know, I do my own form of meditation while watching content many times. Um, it's, I, I just, I approach things in my own way. And I don't believe that there is a better way um, for everyone. I believe that there's the way I live and the way is the way you live. Um, and I do believe that there's, the, you know, undeniable facts um, there are, you know, if we cut more trees than we plant, we will run out of trees. Mm. Just a real statement. Yeah. Um, right. So what do we do about those things? You know, do we want to live in a world without trees? Should we fight against climate change or should we just like want better air and pollute and, and, and water, right. And fight yeah. pollution, yeah. you know? So these are things that are, to me are nonpartisan, um, and there's logic behind them. And, For but sure. the truth is that the way that they're presented, the story fails us. Yeah. And that's, that's a problem. Yeah. I, that's the thing about, you know, being able to interview people on podcasts and you'll probably agree with me. You get so many perspectives. Totally. And it actually, I learned so much. Like Absolutely. It's, it's crazy, but you know, I'll have the, I'll have the, the complete opposite opinions. I'll have one person totally. that's, you know, pro pro vegan and then one that's carnivore and then one that's in the middle. And then, you know, <laughs> that's just like, you know, the comparison as far as like any sort of ideas, I'll have both sides. And and I, it allows me to really think about it because there's, this is a human that believes in that. And it's like, totally. all right, this person believes in that. There's got to be a reason, you know, they're a doctor or they're, they're smart and they, they're healthy and, or whatever, whatever it may be. I, I, it allows me to really think outside the box and to understand there's got to be a reason they're thinking that. So I need to explore this. Right. Yes. Yes. And the more that you show compassion, whether or not you agree with their what their thinking is or not, I think the more that you end up creating connection and you end up actually speaking deeply into uh, your own psyche, but also their psyche as well. Yeah. The more we listen to one another, the more likely we are to change the tides. And is it wise to want to change the world? I don't know. Uh, I think many of us want to. Um, but you know, I think we, we, we need to do exactly what's written behind you, which is yeah. trust the universe. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, uh, that's just it, you know, and uh, I feel that there's, it doesn't have to be so black and white about everything, you know, us versus them. It's just easier for us to be in boxes, right? Just to kind of. Well, but it's because that's how the story works, right? Yeah. There's always a villain and there's always a hero. And that's <laughs> yeah. the story. That, that's the only story we know. Like it's yeah. this story that is older than time, right? Yeah. Any, any religion, there's the, 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 you know, the, the uh, heaven and hell, there's this and that, you know what I mean? It's yeah. black and white. It, and it's always that yin yang that comes together because we, we see things through contrast. Like literally the, f the way we see the world is that yeah. certain things are more contrasted than others. And the way that the light reflects off something lets us know that that's where the wall is and that's where the door is and that's where this is and that is and so on and so forth. So of course we're going to see therefore contrast in everything yeah. else that we see, right? And, and explore and, and think about. Um, and, and I think the more we, uh, we just level down to the human condition, the more that we get to learn and grow. Mm. Yeah, that's so true. So I want to unpack a little bit of your ayahuasca. What was your number one takeaway from that journey? Was that your first time doing it? Was uh, that, or, or what? It, was, it was the first time I was sitting in ceremony doing it properly. So, so yeah. it was the first time I went through a full experience of, it was a nine day retreat. Wow, that's uh, a long time. Yeah, it had three ayahuasca ceremonies, but it had a tobacco purge at the beginning. Um, and it also had a, um, a Wachuma ceremony at the end. And right. I also did combo, okay, in the middle of it, wow. uh, which was un, unplanned, let's say, but it was very healing. What I'll say is that ayahuasca didn't teach me anything I didn't already know. What I mean by that is all the wisdom that you hear or see with your eyes or whatever you're in your, in your mind in the closed dark room that is, uh, you know, with your eyes closed for the most part. Um, when you're sitting in the maloka and listening to these, you know, tribal chants and, and, and you know, these beautiful uh, space holders and retreat leaders and shamans, whatever you want to call them. Um, you are basically sitting down and taking the time to go on a deep inward journey, which very rarely we do. And, and all the wisdom that you hear is in a way reflected through you uh, and for you in the, in the universe, right? Like it's like, it's almost like I, it was just reaffirming what I already knew to be true. And to me, the ceremony began not the day I drank a, you know, a little shot of, of, of uh, plant medicine, but more so the day that I said I was going to go and I knew that it could be very um, impactful. I knew that it can really shift my perspective and that it had the opportunity to potentially radically change my own perspective. And in that saying yes to that, I already knew like, oh, I should probably like cut out coffee. I should probably uh, rest more. I should probably play more. I should probably um, blah, 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 blah. Whatever the shoulds are, whatever came after that should was already coming through the day I said yes. And so that is the gift. The gift is the, is the time that you took to recognize where you're out of integrity, not with the world necessarily, but with your own world, your own perspective. And, and we get to restore that integrity or we get to at least observe whether or not we want to restore that integrity and take the time to think about what integrity means to us. Um, and so for some, that's a diet shift. For some, that's like, I need to quit my job. For some, that's some radical change that says, I went from you know, this, this big thing to all the way to the other side. And for me, it was more nuanced. Um, you know, I do plant medicines uh, or you know, uh, psychedelics on a, on a regular basis as a form of therapy. For me, it is therapy. It is a way that I can deal with the PTSD of learning too much about the world, honestly. Um, and so for me, I do it as an equinox solstice thing. You know, coming up this weekend, I will, I will take a plant medicine in a very ceremonious way, you know, a natural plant medicine that is meant to be a deep dive into myself, into what I want to see happen in the new year. And the way I see it is the new year starts the day that the sun starts to rise again. That's why Christmas is where Christmas is. It's, you know, the, the coldest day, the long, shortest day of the year is December 21st, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, of course. Yeah. Um, and you, which is, by the way, another perspective shift, right? Like, yeah. it's the total opposite. And if you're in Australia, Dude, right? It's so, crazy. Which is crazy, which is so wild, right? Like the but hottest day of the year there. It blew, blew my mind when I Absolutely. So all that to say yeah. that you, your perspective is different, but, but you know, on, on December 25th is when the sun begins to rise again and it, and it starts to move on the horizon. And so I believe the story of Jesus, like the story of many religions, uh, many religions before this, my, Moses, Mises, blah, 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 right? You could think yeah. about him, go back to Zeitgeist again yeah. and back the first <laughs> yeah. one. I'm like, um, I've heard this before. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It's impactful. It, it, yeah. It's a story. Yeah. Okay, so how you anthropomorphize it and turn it into whether there's one God or many gods or this, that, or the other. Look, I, that's your, for you to believe. 
Okay. And, and that's, and that's up to you. I believe there's wisdom in those stories without a doubt. Uh, but those stories are also used for malice. And for me, I celebrate that day. And I celebrate those days and those equinoxes and solstices cool. uh, through plant medicine because it allows me to reconnect to nature. And I would say that that's my, my, highest, um, my highest wisdom that comes from these plant medicines is always that it's always a form of why simply because. And it always marries me to Mother Nature and, and Father Sky, if you want to see it that way. It always reconnects me to the, the humanity that I am a part of and lets me know that I am just a small speck of dust that somehow formed through all these miracles into what it is today. And somehow I speak to you on the other side of this beautiful country through a microphone that somehow does its thing and goes through a preamp and thing and blah, 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 <laughs> and makes all of this possible. Yeah. The world is magic. It yeah. reconnects me to the world of magic. And that's what Disney was all about. That's what, it, yeah. that's what it's meant to share. And that's why everyone's freaking out about Baby Yoda and Star Wars is because these stories are just, they, they, they allow us to dream for a yeah. minute. Yeah. And that's what ayahuasca and plant medicines do. They create a dream state. They create a state where the, the literal chemical cocktail in your mind, in, in ayahuasca's case, the DMT releases almost like you are in a dream, uh, right? And, and, and allows you to to dream with your eyes wide open. And in this case, in, you know, in, in Maloka with your eyes closed, but with your mind open, with your, with your conscious mind paying attention to what is being brought to you. Yeah. Um, and everyone experiences something different. Some people freak out. Some people do this. Some people do that. There's fear. I don't believe it's a drug for everyone. I believe that there are, there are steps to take before you just jump in into the deep end. And at the same time, for some, they're brave enough and they jump into the deep end. And it's, it's absolutely life-changing. For me, it was more nuanced. It was more a one degree shift. Uh, but that one degree shift when you're moving at a thousand miles an hour, uh, you know, like my career is and like I am and not because I'm, a, you know, I think I'm better than anyone just because that's, I just move so quickly. I'm doing so many things. Uh, it, it's a huge difference, right? Yeah. Take a one degree shift in, in, uh, in, the, in the trajectory of a plane and, and go long enough and far enough. And it's the difference between ending up in Thailand and in Australia if totally. you're leaving from Montreal, right? So yeah, it's so true. No, I love the perspective, man. <laughs> I'm like, I'm thinking, I'm like, oh shit, we got to wrap this up soon. So, cause I know you got, but I, I, yeah, no worries. Dude, where, like, where can everybody check you out and talk, walk us through a little bit more, um, about superhero Academy or what else you got going on so we can direct everybody to where they need to go. <laughs> Sure. Uh, look, if you've gotten all the way to this point in the podcast, what you know is that I, I was able to keep your attention. And in fact, I love to support people in what they want to spend attention and time and attention on. And so your hobbies, the things you're passionate about, the things you believe, the things you have conviction for, um, I want to help you turn those into a career because I don't, I hate to see people doing jobs and things and spending any amount of time doing things they don't love. Now, it's not to say that it's going to be easy. It's not to say that entrepreneurship and any of those things are easy. In fact, the fact that I'm able to speak so clearly about my story and not do ums and ahs is it comes from years of me doing this, you know, telling my story, sharing what I know, sharing what I believe and what has come through, through me and for me. Yeah. And so I believe that you weren't born to pay bills and taxes. I believe that you have more potential than what you are sometimes alluding to for yourself. And I believe the same is true for me. And I'm on that hero's journey and I just want you to be on that hero's journey too. The reason I created Superhero Academy is because I literally asked myself, what do I want to do in the world? And when I was a kid, my answer was, I want to be Batman. Mm. And so whatever your answer was or maybe is still today, I just want you to follow that. Mm. So if you've come here and you found value, number one, hit that like button. Your boy here who's running this podcast has been doing episode after episode after episode. Yeah. And if you watch this, he's fucking creating a ton of value for you. So hit that like button, leave a comment subscribe, share, do something. I mean, look, you can vote with your attention and your dollar and, this, and they're both equally powerful. That's why Facebook wants your attention and your data, right? Yeah. But the truth is that you were born for more than just being a cog in the machine. So why not live boldly? Why not do something that you know is going to enliven you, that scares you, that pulls you out of your comfort zone and pulls you into something that is bigger and better than yourself, not because I told you to, but because you want to be better than yourself because that's a mentality and you're a choice away from doing it. That's what Superhero Academy does. We teach you the how-tos, the real world skills, not the bullshit, not the theory. It's real world skills available 24 hours a day, seven days a week from multiple teachers, not just me. My course is Passion to Profit, but we have a Facebook ads course coming out soon. We have a new course on social media management and how to reach your first million followers that just came out on our platform, not taught by me. 
all of these things are, are, are here to inform you and empower you. And they're here to do that from a form or from a place of mentorship and of actual support rather than just me saying, this is the truth and, yeah. you know, spew this out on an exam. So it's real world, real world content, real world stuff applicable in your life, but I can't do it for you. I can only give you the information. If you don't love it, get your money back. Uh, but for you to take it seriously, we have to take money from you because it's the only way you're going to fucking do it. Yeah. I know because you know all those eBooks that end up in your email that you never read and all the things that the audible credits of books that you've never listened to. Let's be real here. If you don't really value it, if you don't spend enough time and energy, if there's not a high enough cost, there's not a high enough buy-in. So we, we do that. And, and you know, <laughs> this is part of the platform. You know, I'm yeah. just a guy who's, who's looking to empower others um, like that and to, to, to shift their own story and to live their own hero's journey. That's yeah. what Superhero Academy is about. That's what I'm about. I don't need to sell you. If you love it, you know where the links are. Awesome. We'll have all that in the show notes. That's, bro, <laughs> how does somebody not go there right now? <laughs> if you guys listening, how do if you If you're watching go this, right? you know you go there. Exactly. Like how, how do you not go there after hearing that, bro? Like that's, I love it, man. And um, I'm super, super grateful that we connected again. I know it's, yeah. it's, it's definitely a relationship that we can build on as well, as far as we're both trying to make impact where we are making impact. And, um, uh, I'm, ex I'm super excited to see, you know, where that goes and who knows, man, we're connected. I've been connected to a few different people that know you, um, mm. you know, who else, Matt Belair, I got, I got Samantha Lotus coming on tomorrow. Like, yeah. You know, like, like amazing humans. And that's what I love. And it's all come from having a platform like this to be able totally. to connect and, you know, just like blow my mind as well. I'm a bit selfish. I get to, I get to, val I get to get a lot of this too. That's why I run a podcast. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a human connection. I get to learn and, and speak to some of the most badass people and who give real time to go deep into the conversation versus a snippet on one minute on Facebook. Yeah. All right, one, one last question. We'll do it super quick before we got to get out of here. No worries. Out of all the adversity you've had in your life, what is one lesson that it's taught you? Attitude is everything. That's it. Your perspective is just, you know, how the results you have are based on the attitude you choose to, uh, to play out via the things that are happening in your life. You're not going to change anything by complaining. You're not going to change anything by trying to make it something else. You're going to change something by first recognizing that you got to control what you can control. And the first and most powerful thing you get to control is your attitude and therefore your perspective, therefore your response, whether you choose to react to something versus act in a particular way. It is the number one thing that has changed my life. My attitude is my gratitude. It is what makes me move forward. And I know that sounds like a cheesy meme that you saw on some fucking Facebook page, kind of like ours, yeah. but, but True. it is a real truth. There's real wisdom to it. And, um, and yeah, and you got to trust, you got to trust the universe. Yeah. Awesome, shout man. To, shout out to that poster. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, again, thank you so much, brother. This has been awesome. No problem, man. Absolutely a pleasure. We'll have everything for everybody to come check you out. Mark Angelo, everybody. Have a good one.